Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to the presentation of the Bundesbank's annual report 2022. And as was said in the introduction, I would also like to extend a very warm welcome to those of you attending via our live stream. After a three-year break, our press conference presenting the annual report is now a fully in-person event once again. It's being held at the Bundesbank's regional office in Hess for the first time. This is because, as you know, we have cleared out our main building on Wilhelm Epsteinstrasse so that after 50 years of use, it can be refurbished and modernized from top to bottom. The lineup greeting you today is like wiser first. Ms. Ingrid Herden has been Head of Directorate General Communications since October 2022, and Mr. Joachim Wurmeling of our Executive Board assumed responsibility for Directorate General Controlling, Accounting and Organization at the start of this year. Later on, he will present and discuss details of our annual accounts. And um, I have to blow my nose occasionally, apologize up front, because I've got a bit of a cold back from a business trip to India, so forgive me. I'd like to start with the economic and price developments as well as monetary policy decisions related to them. For one year now, Russia's terrible war of aggression against Ukraine has been raging. The extent of devastation and destruction, as well as the human suffering, are unspeakable. The war and its side effects have left a mark on economic developments as well, especially due to the energy crisis they have triggered. For example, Germany's recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic was throttled to a considerable extent. Just as a reminder, at the beginning of 2022, the federal government had been expecting the German economy to grow at an annual rate of 3.6%. Actual real growth then clocked in at 1.9% after calendar adjustment. Thus, roughly half the figure expected at the beginning of the year, but considerably better than had been feared at times. It was not only the energy crisis and the strong price increases they triggered that weighed on the German economy. Supply bottlenecks, too, continued to apply pressure. At times, they were exacerbated by the Ukraine war. The business climate and consumer sentiment deteriorated massively. Uncertainty began to spread. Owing to surging consumer prices, for one thing, and to energy supply for another. But private consumption still increased, strongly so, in fact. This was thanks first and foremost to the catch-up effects following the lifting of the coronavirus restrictions. This easing boosted activity in consumer-related services sectors in particular. Exports and investments or output was higher than before the pandemic for the first time in summer. Towards the end of the year, however, the positive effects from the lifting of the coronavirus virus mitigation measures tailed off. In addition, the global economy slowed further. This put a damper on export demand. And in particular, uncertainty surrounding energy supply and its costs weighed heavily on enterprises and households. The situation in the energy markets eased over the course of this winter half year. On top of that, uh, the feared gas shortage was successfully averted thanks to efforts to save energy as well as to mild temperatures. Nevertheless, economic output in the final quarter of 2022 was still down by 0.4% on the quarter. German economic output is likely to contract in the first quarter of 2023 too. Although there could be a gradual pickup in the second quarter, there is still no sign of any major improvement for now. As before, our experts are not expecting there to be a visible economic recovery until the second half of the year. From today's vantage point, gross domestic product is likely to decline slightly for the full year, which would be less of a drop than projected in December, however. 2022 will go down in Germany's economic history as a year of one of the highest inflation rates since the foundation of the Federal Republic. 
as measured by the Harmonized Index of Consumer Prices, HICP, which is used for the Euro Area Monetary Policy, the annual rate of inflation went up to 8.7%. Over the course of the year, the HICP rate even hit double, digit, double digits for a time. For the Euro Area as a whole, the average inflation rate for 2022 came in at 8.4% which was by far the highest rate since the introduction of the euro. Sharp rises in energy and food prices were the main drivers of inflation. Yet non-energy industrial goods and services also became considerably more expensive. It's important to point out that inflation had already been accelerating prior to Russia's attack on Ukraine. The global economy had rebounded unexpectedly quickly from the crisis brought about by the pandemic. Existing supply chain disruptions and the strong surge in demand therefore led to supply bottlenecks. With the war and its repercussions, inflation picked up considerably, and it did so across the board. This is reflected not least in the rise in core inflation rates. The annual HICP rate, excluding energy and food, in January stood at 5.1% in Germany and 5.3% in the euro area. What the numbers show us is that the underlying price pressures remain very high, although we also assume that the wave of inflation has peaked. We are expecting the inflation rate to fall only gradually. The ECB staff will publish, publish its updated projections in two weeks' time. Without wishing to preempt them, please still allow me to make the following point. Although the recent decline in energy prices will affect the short-term outlook, it will initially have no essential bearing on the medium-term projections. For Germany, our experts are now assuming that we will end up with an average HICP inflation rate of between 6 and 7 and 7% 7 in 2023, 6 and 7%. But in 2024, and possibly also in 2025, inflation rates, including core inflation, will still be well above the 2% mark. One reason for this is that the government energy price breaks will be lifted, which will be associated with rebound effects of a comparable magnitude. Another is that the higher than average wage increases are likely to feed increasingly into prices. At all events, inflation rates will not automatically return to our target rate of 2% in the euro area in a timely manner. Let me now turn to monetary policy. We therefore need a monetary policy in which action is decisive and the necessary steps are taken to restore price stability. Just one year ago, ladies and gentlemen, European monetary policy was extraordinarily accommodating. The deposit facility rate stood at minus 0.5%, and the euro system was continuing to increase its asset holdings. And then the turnaround occurred, a change of course in monetary policy such as had not been seen in a long time. At the end of March, net purchases under the Pandemic Emergency Purchasing Program, PEP, were discontinued, and three months later, the same happened with net purchases under the older APP program. In June, the Governing Council of the ECB raised its key interest rates by 50 basis points, thus closing the chapter on negative interest rates. That was then followed by two interest rate hikes of 75 basis points each and another two of 50 basis points each. This meant that within the space of not even eight months, key interest rates had been raised by 300 basis points, and the ECB Governing Council has signaled an increase by a further 50 percent, by a f rather 50 basis points rather for March. In addition, there were a number of other modifications to monetary policy, one of which I would like to mention here, and that's the creation of the Transmission Protection Instrument, or TPI for short. 
It can be activated to counter disorderly and unwarranted market dynamics that pose a threat to the achievement of price stability. The TPI is designed to ensure that the monetary policy stance is transmitted smoothly across all euro area countries, or in technical terms, to ensure the singleness of the Governing Council's monetary policy. Activation of the TPI is based on a comprehensive assessment by the ECB Governing Council. It has, ha it has not had to be activated thus far, and I hope it stays that way. At our latest meeting, we also decided on the starting point for reducing holdings under the APP. From March to June 2023, 15 billion per month on average of principal payments from maturing securities will not be reinvested anymore. That corresponds to around half of the redemptions over that period of time. This also represents an important contribution to the normalization of monetary policy. In the past few years, the euro system expanded its balance sheet enormously for monetary policy reasons. The large volume of central bank asset holdings is having a dampening effect, particularly at the longer end of the yield curve. At the short end, however, the euro system has been pushing up the yield curve by raising ECB key interest rates substantially. In the long run, something has to give. Moreover, there is no reason for supplying the financial system over the long term with such ample liquidity as is being provided now. I am therefore in favor of taking a deeper path of reduction starting in July in the light of experience gained up to that point. I expect markets to cope well with the reduction in the euro system's asset holdings. And given the current outlook for inflation, it will simply take too long otherwise. After all, we need to look at the current figure of 15 billion in relation to monetary policy asset holdings of just under 5 trillion euros. Interest rate movements continue to be at the heart of the current monetary policy debate. One thing is clear, the interest rate step announced for March will not be the last. Further, significant raising of policy rates might even be necessary afterwards, too. We naturally reassess the situation at every meeting. We are not locked into a given path. But as things stand today, I believe that policy interest rates need to be even higher in order to return the inflation rate to our 2% target in a timely manner. To accomplish this, we need interest rates to be at a sufficiently high level. And, very importantly, we need to maintain that level until such time as the data and projections provide us with sufficient evidence that inflation is returning to our medium-term target of 2%. This also has to be reflected in underlying inflation. Until that is the case, interest rate cuts are a non-starter. That is my very firm conviction. Both the real economy and financial markets, moreover, have coped well with the tightening of monetary policy. So to hesitate now, to end the tightening at an early stage, or to even loosen monetary policy would be a cardinal error. This is because there would be a grave danger of the strong level of inflation eating further and further into our lives, of inflation becoming entrenched at an elevated level. And there would still afterwards be, this would be about how monetary policy has to act and what it has to do and preserve. And there would still be the risk of longer-term inflation expectations becoming de-anchored. Since the summer of 2021, market-based indicators and expert surveys have been showing significant increases. However, survey-based longer-term expe expert expectations have been going back down towards our target of late. We have also recently been seeing slight declines in our Bundesbank survey of households and firms. Respondents are also expecting slightly lower inflation rates five years ahead than they did in autumn. 
However, this should not tempt us to let up in our efforts. Quite the contrary. I am convinced that expectations have fallen because, amongst other factors, respondents are convinced of our resolve. People see that we have taken decisive action and they are expecting us to continue to act decisively until we have done our job. If we were to dash this expectation, we should not be surprised to see inflation expectations go back up. It is our job to reduce inflation and restore price stability. It is our responsibility. But of course, other agents need to be aware of their responsibilities too. For example, fiscal policy should provide, as far as possible, targeted relief only to those parties hit hard by hit hardest by price increases and only for as long as necessary. The broader and more indiscriminate the relief, the more additional inflationary pressure fiscal policy will cause. That should be avoided. Fiscal policy agents should also resist the temptation to take advantage of fiscal space for additional spending programs. Which brings me to our annual accounts. The Bundesbank sustained exceptional financial burdens in 2022. One reason for this was the rise in U.S. capital market rates which caused our foreign currency reserves to lose value. Another reason was the rise in euro area key policy rates. The euro system's interest rate increases are necessary in order to combat high inflation, as I have just set out. However, they have weighed on net interest income and the net result of the pooling of monetary income. Owing to the policy rate hikes, we and other Eurosystem central banks are now paying higher interest rates on the deposits held with us by commercial banks. At the same time, income from what continue to be very sizable holdings of bonds will remain relatively stable for the time being, given that the interest on these bonds is fixed for the longer term. In other words, the mismatch between assets and liabilities becomes clear here. To be sure, monetary policy decisions, the decisions taken did also provide some relief. These included the suspension of the two-tier system for the remuneration of deposits and the particularly favorable terms of the refinancing operations, Teltro 3, the targeted longer-term refinancing operations. Overall, however, the financial burdens predominated. The Bundesbank has repeatedly pointed out the financial risks associated with the extensive asset purchases and made corresponding provisions. Starting from as back as the 2010 financial year, extensive general risk provisions were set aside. In its 2016 annual accounts, the Bundesbank began to build up provisions for interest rate risk. In addition, the risks were regularly addressed at the annual press conferences, which some of you attended. In the past two years, 2020 and 2021, additional risk provisioning was the main reason why the Bundesbank did not distribute any profits. A total of just over 20 billion euros in general risk provisions have been set aside. The Bundesbank is reporting a result of zero in its profit and loss account for the 2022 financial year. In doing so, we are tapping 1 billion euros of our provisions for general risks. Last year, policy rates were still at all-time lows until July. The financial burdens resulting from the increase in interest rates have therefore been limited thus far. In the years to come, the, burden, the burdens on the Bundesbank's profit and loss account are likely to increase considerably. Tapping into the provisions for general risks for 2022 reduces this item to 19.2 billion euros. The statutory reserves of 2.5 billion euros are available as an additional buffer. 
there is a high degree of uncertainty associated with the persistence and the scale of the financial burdens the Bundesbank is facing. On the basis of various calculations and projections, our risk provisions are likely to still be sufficient this year. In subsequent years, however, the burdens will probably exceed our financial buffers, in which case we will report a loss carry forward. The Bundesbank already did this back in the 1970s, so this is nothing new. With the help of future profits, we will then offset the loss carry forward over the course of time, as we did in the 1970s. The Bundesbank's balance sheet is sound. Ladies and gentlemen, as the Bank for International Settlements recently put it quite clearly in, the, in a paper on central bank losses, and I quote from that paper, unlike commercial banks, central banks do not seek profits. They cannot be insolvent in the conventional sense as they can, in principle, issue more currency to meet domestic currency obligations and they face no regulatory capital minima precisely because of their unique purpose. It is our mandate, and I think I made this clear, to safeguard price stability. We must fulfill this mandate, and we will fulfill this mandate. Earnings developments now and in the coming years are ultimately the result of the exceptionally accommodating monetary policy stance of the past few years. Now, a tight monetary policy is needed in order to restore price stability in a timely manner. If this entails financial burdens, we will have to and will be able to cope with them. The burdens will pass, and afterwards we will be able to generate profits again. The euro system must now do what needs to be done. And with that, I will hand over to Joachim Wermeling, who will present further details on our annual accounts. Thank you very much for your attention, and we will certainly have the opportunity for questions and answers on some of what I present, some things that I presented. Joachim. Thank you, dear namesake, ladies and gentlemen. Let me also welcome you. It's the first time that I'm speaking to you in this new capacity. However, of course, as a banking supervisor, I'm quite familiar with banking balances, but it's certainly a new role being responsible for the balance sheet yourself. Let me present a few numbers on the most important indicators which President Nagel mentioned and beyond these. So a few things that I find important concerning the balance sheet and the um, profit and loss accounts. The balance sheet really only shows minor changes. The total assets of the result of monetary policy activities has not grown any further. It has decreased, in fact. So at 2.9 billion euros, it's 4% below the record level of more than 3 billion euros in the previous year. On the asset side of the balance sheet, we have the claims from monetary policy operations which have increased, decreased, and especially because of the redemption of the TLTRO loans, Mr. Nagel pointed this out. On the other hand, the euro securities have grown from the monetary policy program, more have been purchased. The increase was 45 billion euros because of the PSPP and PEP. Uh, programs in the first half year. Another influencing factor for the total assets was the liquidity inflows in the previous years coming from other countries, but this came to a standstill in 2022. The increase is 8 billion euros, and the target to claim on the balance sheet date is 1.2 billion euros, so pretty close to the high of 1.277 uh, billion euros of the end of 2022. The 
liability side then of the balance sheet, we have a decrease in the deposits, the deposits of foreign depositors due to the lower portfolios have decreased by 27% from 198 billion. On the other hand, the claims from the monetary policy operations have changed compared to the previous year, 62 billion of growth to 1200 billion. So the deposits have increased by about 5%. In the overall euro system, in fact, about one third of all deposits of credit institutions are with the Bundesbank. What has also grown is the volume of the banknotes issued by Bundesbank to 900 billion euros by 16 billion. That's an increase by 2%. What's also of interest is the revaluation accounts. This is an item which makes it possible to offset the volatility of Bundesbank, which comes from changes in valuation. You can see the breakdown here in this slide. The most important revaluation item, of course, is the reserve for the 3,355 tons of gold. In fact, the value is about 180 billion euros above the cost of purchasing it. So this is a reserve for us, and it's part of the considerable own funds of Bundesbank. Underlining the soundness which the president mentioned. So in fact, it's on firm ground, the balance sheet of Deutsche Bundesbank, and this certainly makes it easier for us to bear losses over a certain period of time. And this brings me to the second part of my presentation, the profit and loss accounts. The situation is clearly less favorable than in 2022. The turnaround on interest rates has meant a lot of movement, but the increases in key interest rates are reflected on both sides of our profit and loss accounts. As a central bank, it's so complex this will lead to changes in many components. So the profit and loss accounts, which you see here, reflects this complexity. It's not just a single item, like the deposit rates, which we pay to the banks, which has an impact on the profit and loss, but many other items are also influenced. So in fact, it's a bit like a kaleidoscope. When you rotate it, the whole image changes, and it's a bit like this with the profit and loss accounts of Bundesbank whenever interest rates change. The biggest component is the net interest income, and in 2022 we had two completely different worlds, the first half year with negative interest rates, and then in the second half when the key interest rates increased. And all in all, this means that although we had rising spending on interest on deposits, there is still a profit below the line on the net interest income. You see this in the first column, it's about 1.5 billion euros. Net interest income was increased because we had higher interest income in the monetary policy portfolios, especially from the indexed bond uh, bonds, which uh, brought in more. And there were also certain effects that came from the end of the two-tier um, remuneration and then the end of the special interest rates on the TLTROs. The interest rate was no longer as high as before. But these positive effects were partly compensated by the rise in the deposit facility rates, which I mentioned, but also by the average interest rate on TLTRO3 operations, and of course also because there were no longer the negative interest rates on deposits. It is also worth mentioning in this regard that the rise in key interest rates means that for the first time since 2016, interest income is being generated again from the target two balance of 7,000 
298 million euros. Those of you who have followed the balance sheet press release of ECB have seen that it leads to expenses from for them, but this is not an income which is directly reflected in our profit and loss accounts because this target balance is also offset by deposits of the banks on which we have to pay interest, so this offsets this income. Interest income from monetary policy portfolios rose on balance by 2.6 billion euros, and inflation-linked bonds generated interest totaling 3 billion euros. It was only 270 million euros in the previous year. So this is a net result, net interest result. Then a few more items, the result of financial operations and write-downs and risk provisions were 1.1 billion lower than the previous year, realized gains and losses decreased on balance by 376 million to 2 million euros due to rising capital market yields. Write-downs of on our treasury notes because uh, they are marked to market because of the higher yields in the U.S. So then the income from participating interest, especially from the ECB, owing to the lack of profit distribution from the ECB, fell by 144 million to 28 million. The negative impact of the net result of pooling of monetary income increased by 1 billion euros to a negative 2.2 billion euros, mainly owing to the low remuneration on the monetary policy holdings of supranational securities, which the Bundesbank itself doesn't hold. Also, other operations are involved, like the issuing of cash, and all of this belongs to the euro system as a whole. So when we look at our balance sheet and our profit and loss accounts, if we have a higher profit than is due to us, due to a distribution key, then uh, this has to be offset and this is also a spending item which has grown because of this turnaround in interest rates. So it's at least four items where the turnaround on interest rates has its impact. Some of it is positive, some of it is negative, and you can see the balance here. The other income decreased. This is due to the partial derecognition of Deutsche Mark banknotes. And there's also the administrative expenses, which you find here, and the risk provisions. Operating result was negative by about 1 billion euros, but if you look at the risk provision. The, this is the difference compared to the previous year when we had an addition of 1.4 billion euros. This is no longer the case. On the contrary, we have to release about 1 billion, and the balance is this change then of 2.3 billion euros. As in the previous year, the profit and loss account for financial year 2022 closed with a balanced result. In other words, there was zero distributable profit, as in 2022. Thank you. Thank you for the statements. Let me now turn to your questions. And I'd ask you up front to please always use a microphone, otherwise you wouldn't be heard in the live stream. I'd also like to ask you that if you have a question specifically to one of the two executive board members, then could you please say so? Mr. Siedenbedel. Thank you very much. I'd be very interested in how things will continue with the asset holdings. Do you expect to be selling assets, bonds again, where uh, you might have to d realize some losses on bond prices, or are we only talking about the replacement of bonds, which is reduced? Well, let me answer that question specifically. Active selling of bonds, of assets, is something that I don't see. 
In my comments, I made it clear that my wish would be rather to step up the speed of the redeemed, of the matured securities from July. I think we could do more than the 15 billion per month, but I don't see active selling, no. The next question is from Mr. Lacour. Hello. Philippe Lacour from Agence France Presse, and I have a question on inflation. The German Statistics Office uh, changed its methodology in the midst of this sea change, uh, major change compared to the 70s, in terms of how it measures inflation. That leads to lower inflation rates calculated by the German Statistics Office. Wouldn't that make the interpretation of things more difficult, which wouldn't be welcome? even more so because there will be a bigger gap between the actually measured inflation and the one projected. In October, you don't have 10 percent anymore. At the time, it was still flagged in red. And uh, the, the difference, a gap w between that and the perception of inflation by the general population, which wouldn't be helpful. Mr. Lacour, let me answer that. I can't talk on behalf of the uh, Statistische Bundesamt, the German Statistics Office, but what it did was a regular exercise. After five years, it changes the reference here. And that happened before it was 2015, and this was changed. The new reference year is 2020, and also looking at the basket. So that was usual practice. One thing that was perhaps a little regress regrettable on the day of the ECB meeting that technical change and the information was there and uh, the change happened then and numbers for Germany were not available on the specific date. But as far as the exercise is concerned, it's highly regular. When it comes to the inflation numbers, I have to say that even after this change, inflation is ex the inf inflation projections are still too high. The expected inflation is too high. That's, I guess, the key question, rather than the technical detail of how it's uh, calculated. The basic statement has stayed the same. The inflation rate is too high. Monetary policy has to do something about it. The next question comes from Mr. Zidra of Süddeutsche Zeitung. Hello, Mr. Wermeling. I would like to ask you to explain once more how these losses originated. I understood the net interest income, that the cost of interest on the higher deposits leads to this. I understood this, but the other costs, and there was this one billion. It was quite considerable amounts, and I suppose they were not negative in the years before. Maybe you could explained this in simple words at the ECB conference. We didn't understand last week how, where these losses came from. I'll do my best. Maybe we could return to this chart. Maybe we could use this chart which shows both the previous year and the last year. It's among the backup slides. No, not this one. A bit further. Well, let's uh, use this change chart then, which we had. Uh, I thought that we'd also have a different one, but uh, we can use this one. Here you can see the main drivers of the profit and loss account, Mr. Zidra, and you said that the net interest income was positive. You understood this, and the various uh, movements and the movements offsetting them. Then there were the losses from financial operations, uh, write-downs on foreign currency and bonds. This is mainly from currency reserves. And the value changes here come from exchange rate fluctuations, and they also come from the change in interest rates in the currency spaces from which we purchased foreign currency. Then participating interests. I pointed out that we are not receiving any profit from the ECB. And then the net 
income from monetary income. This is really difficult to explain. The monetary, the, the net results of pooling of monetary income, this is the income practically that we receive from the fiat money. So if we issue any banknotes, they need to be paid by the banks, and we can invest this money and receive an income from this. All central banks of the euro system do this, but this income then is really due to the euro system because it's euros which we create. And as these monetary policy operations are used differently in different countries, there is an imbalance. For example, 50% of the banknotes is issued by us. So we receive for t payment for these banknotes, and we can invest this money, although only 26.7% of the income is due to us according to the capital key, the distribution key. So we are receiving more than is actually due to us, and so for this reason, this additional income from the net interest income has to be paid out. And this means that we pay an interest rate on this positive balance. And as this interest was zero in the last few years, but now with the increase in key interest rates, it has increased, there is a spending item all of a sudden that we're facing, and it has increased. Then I mentioned uh, the personnel costs and non-personnel costs and the other income and losses. Well, due to the change in the interest rate difference between Europe and especially the U.S., we had to write down U.S. treasuries, which we marked to market, and some has been disposed of, and this has led to certain losses. So mainly these are these items. Has it become a bit clearer? Well, if you allow me to make it even clearer, if you look at the write-down on our U.S. dollar portfolio, if you compare the balance sheet of 2021 and 2022, there were additional write-downs of 761 million euros. And behind this, of course, there is the interest rate increases of the American Central Bank. These interest impact which comes from the changes in monetary policy, this shows what impact it has on the balance sheet. So the bonds which we keep in our portfolio have low interest rates, so their value is decreased because of higher yields, and we have to write this down. We mark to market these, whereas the euro bonds are um, kept at book value. Maybe one more thing, Mr. Lacour, that I could point out concerning the inflation numbers. I mean, on the harmonized consumer price index, there were new changes. And we look at the harmonized consumer price index. The German consumer price index, which has high attention in Germany, in, there, in this you has this change. But for our monetary policy, it's the harmonized consumer price index, which is decisive. Frank Mahlmeister. Frank Mahlmeister from Platte Brief. You have the floor. Hello, Mr. Nagel. You said that in your surveys, consumers and market participants said uh, that they see that you are actively combating inflation, but as for the markets, uh, there have been some doubts as to your credibility, or was it perhaps a problem of communication? What's your view on that? How could it happen that there were uh, such upheavals, such a tantrum, and uh, do you think that you have brought them on board now? And there's one question I have. In your speech, you said further rate hikes after March were necessary, and I think you said the same thing in India. But there's one thing that I didn't hear. Perhaps you said it, perhaps you didn't. 
but later on you said rate hikes and you didn't say clear or significant you didn't add anything to it so could you perhaps elaborate on the intensity you meant where the simple steps are uh, enough or where you need significant steps Thank you for that question. As to your first question, the response by markets and market participants, well, it's been for more than 20 years that I've been an observer of markets as part of my career. They are as they are. Sometimes they are overly optimistic, exuberant. Certain exaggerations can happen as well, and I would see it as that. And I think after that, through clear or clearer communication, it was possible to well bring markets back to the level where they should be in an environment where inflation is high central banks have to do their job and in that context we made it clear that we're expecting uh, that we are taking a clear step a clear rate hike in march and this afternoon at 2 p.m. we'll be getting inflation numbers for germany in february as well for the state of north rhine westphalia i've seen the numbers they indicate that inflation will probably remain persistent, uh, persistently high. So I could imagine if the data uh, still shows the clear picture, I think further significant steps might be needed after March. I hope that was clear enough. If that answered your questions, Mr. Akagawa from Nikkei will ask the next question. Hello. And good morning, Shugawa from Nikkei, the daily in Japan. A question to Mr. Naga. In your statement, you pointed out that the war in Ukraine is one of the drivers of inflation. So I wanted to ask you, how do you see the future geopolitical risks and what's your assessment of them? It's not only the war in or on Ukraine that is a driver, but also tension between China and the U.S. might play a role. Could this have an impact on the German or European economy? Thank you for this question. Well, let me perhaps put this in perspective and uh, tell you about the context. In January, in my first speech, I said clearly higher inflation last year before the terrible attack of Russia against Ukraine. The situation then was that the pandemic was about to end and supply bottlenecks were still there. So inflation for the year 2022 was expected to be strong at that point in time. But of course, the 24th of February was quite different then. And as a consequence, inflation more than doubled. Growth rates were cut by more than half. And these terrible events show to what extent the geopolitical situation has an impact on inflation rates and impact on what our job is as central banks to get a grip on inflation again. A terrible impact. And as said earlier, I have brought back a cold uh, from a long trip to India. And I made it clear there how important it is to pursue dialogue under the G20 for as well. And Japan has the G7 presidency this year. So we're expecting these issues, geopolitical issues, to be discussed there as well on these forums. Now, I'm a central banker, so I have to focus on our mandate. I have to focus on our independent mandate. So as a central banker, I would very much hope, and it would make my work much more easier if geopolitical tensions were to ease. Unfortunately for the terrible uh, war, the terrible attack of Russia against Ukraine, we can't see that easing. Birgitte Scholtes of Business Report has the next question. Go ahead. And also of Deutschlandfunk Radio. Mr. Nagel or Mr. Wermeling, I have a question which more relates to domestic economy. The domestic economy is very nervous and the construction sector financing is drying up for construction. And now there is talk of releasing of certain uh, limits, but maybe you could explain how you feel about this. Joachim, let's compliment each other. Yes, in fact, it's being tried by interested parties 
to suggest that the macroprudential buffers would limit construction and housing construction. This is nonsense. We have increased an interest rate hike in financing for buildings going up to about 3.7 percent for a 10-year mortgage. And according to the calculation of Bundesbank, the anti-cyclical capital buffer amounts to about 0.03 percent of interest increase. So if we're now at 3.76, it could be 3.73 otherwise. So for the affordability of mortgages, this, this doesn't play a role. And the impact of monetary policy certainly has arrived in the real estate market by the reduction of lending growth and also due to, by a certain reduction in prices. One last thing, I think we would be ill-advised if now, in view of the difficulties or the issues in housing construction, if we now started to slacken supervisory standards for real estate financing, because this would really mean that the real estate, that there could be a real estate crisis. Let me add, we mustn't overlook this. The real estate industry has had a super situation with the expansive policy, and it's always difficult for them then to adjust to a new normal. And if you look at the 10-year bond y yields, they're at about 270. The five-year ones are a bit higher, so these are market conditions which are more of the common situation. Kenneth Rogoff once said, what we're experiencing here is a move back to the averages of what we were used to before we entered into the super cycle of a very expansive monetary policy, and I can only subscribe to this. Of my list is the next question on my list. I'm sorry. Yes. My name is Buchholz. I'm from finance business. What you've just said, Mr. Nagel, could be seen by somebody who works or is active in the housing sector or is thinking of buying a home. That could be seen as useful advice to buy now and contract the loan now because the terms will be less favorable in two or three years' time. But I think what we do as central bankers uh, is look at the numbers and uh, everybody has to draw their own conclusions from that. But no, my or our statements could never be seen as investment advice. That's always a personal decision, a judgment call. Panagiotis Kutumanis from Frankfurter Neue Presse. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the floor. I have a question on your outlook. You said that in the coming years the burdens will increase, that's your expectation, and that the provisioning set aside so far will probably not be enough, 19.2 percent of uh, provisions, the general risk provisions. Well, my thoughts would be that when you sell assets, then valuation losses will have to be realized, so the burden makes sense. But now you're saying you're not expecting bonds to be sold actively. But more than 19.2 billion euros as the general risk provision, expecting a number higher than that, is that only because of the mismatch of the low yields in your portfolios and the higher deposit facility rate? Will you expect the DFR to go up so much? Or what are the other factors? Are there any other factors? In that equation, you would expect that the U.S. rates will go up some more, will go up significantly and they expect it to go up earlier, and then the Fed would probably start to taper again sooner than Europe. So what are the factors beyond the mismatch, or is it only the mismatch? 
A very good question. Thank you. And this really helps to put our uh, annual results into perspective. When you look at the year 2022, as Mr. Verberling said, we saw the first rate hikes in July last year. So rates went up before they had been negative. The DFR went up from minus 0 0.5 to 0. Then in September, we had the first positive rates on the deposit facility rate. And when you look at our balance sheet, the liability side, you can see that the deposit facility stands at more than 1,100 billion. In other words, it's only in 2023 that we will fully see the positive impact, a fully positive rate year where the DFR rate has actually fu become fully visible on our balance sheet. So when you look at the DFR rate and look at the interest rate difference and make your own calculations, that would be the answer. But I don't have the crystal ball, so it would be almost immoral to be telling you now that in 2023, when we'll be back next year, uh, the amount X is what we expect. There are many factors. You named one of them, the interest rate development in the US, but of course, perhaps more importantly, interest rate developments here in the euro area. There's one core message which is important to us as central banks. We have to do our job, fulfill our mandate, and that's price stability. And it can be uh, periods, even years, where we might have to live with a situation where the provisions for general risks might be eaten up in subsequent years, and we might have to report a loss and then use loss carry forwards over the year and then offset compensate for them again in the years after through profits. That's the business of a central bank, and it's not so uh, atypical. I said that in the 70s, loss carry forwards were reported by the Bundesbank. It was in 74 that they were on their peak after the Bretton Woods system collapsed. When the US dollar assets, because of the exchange rate effects, where the dollar devalued uh, over the Deutsche Mark, and there had to be write downs then. And when you look at the magnitudes of loss carry forwards related to or as a percentage of GDP, they were high write downs that the Bundesbank had to do at the time. What I'm saying with this is that this is almost a well rehearsed exercise. And I love to present profits, but our mandate is clearly different the mandate we've been given. So we can't be compared to a typical commercial bank in that sense. A follow-up question, if I may. For this year, do you expect uh, sizable changes in the amount of the deposit facility? Answer, I can't say right now. There is no way of uh, giving you the answer. That would be highly speculative. Let's see how the year develops. Frank Siebert of Reuters, please. Mr. Nagel, one question on your monetary policy expectations. Over the last few weeks, there has been a reassessment of the terminal rate in the markets, which seems to be more towards 4% for the deposit facility rate. This is quite clear compared to the beginning of the month. The background to this was worried that the core inflation rate could prove to be more stubborn than expected before. What is your assessment? Are the markets right? with these expectations that you're going to revise this upwards. And what do you think of this expectation that the core inflation rate might be more stubborn than we thought recently? Well, first of all, this uh, concept of the terminal rate or mutual rate, which is often then used, these are very, very theoretical assumptions and models which are often based on certain model assumptions. I never really participated in this discussion about a terminal rate or a neutral rate. Some reason for this was being modest based on the experience of these powerful structural changes due to the 24th of February. So I only know one thing, really. At present, the inflationary pattern seems to be quite clear. The inflation numbers are too high. So my approach is we will need to remain battling 
inflation in a robust and stubborn way. We know that inflation is quite a stubborn thing, and we're going to see this again in the February numbers for February. And in monetary policy, you have to be even more stubborn then. This is the experience from the past, and I didn't participate in asking ourselves whether we're in a restrictive range or not. I mean, if you have inflation rates of about 9% and the deposit rate is 25 well, I think this speaks for itself. As a central banker, I know then that this is not the end of the path. The next question comes from Isabelle Bufake of Il Sole 24 Ore. Good morning. I'd like to ask President Nagel one question. I'm sorry. I'll ask my question in English. And please bear with me if I answer in German. But do ask your question in English. So um, it is on stepping up the reductions of the APP. Um, would it, this mean uh, that the uh, pandemic program, would you agree, that uh, is kept out of the stepping up? And also you expect the markets to cope well with the reduction of the Eurosystem's asset holdings uh, reduction. Um, do you think that, um, I mean, are you worried about the financial stability impact of uh, repricing or, or spread widening and are you confident that the markets will cope well because there is TPI in your toolbox? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Let me begin with financial stability. It's a good message when we see that the markets are proving to be quite robust. This also has to do with the fact that Looking back on the crisis of the last 10 years, we have made sure that the banks' balance sheets are sounder. Banks are better equipped with capital. Their liquidity situation is better. So in monetary policy, we've done quite a bit for this. And this is now reflected in these high bond portfolios. You mentioned the APP program and the PEP program. When you look at the amounts of these programs and the term structures, then the APP program certainly is the program on which it was most obvious to start in monetary policy. We started with a 15 billion of reduction per month, and as I said, I'm firmly convinced the markets will be able to digest this quite well. The markets are in a good situation, and I could imagine, and let me repeat this, I could imagine there could be even more than the 15 billion per month, and certainly if you want to get to a normalization of monetary policy, you would also have to look at the PEP program. But the APP program is a good beginning, and we could increase the rate. Concerning the TPI program, I mentioned in my speech a certain assessment of this. It's a program which, under very particular conditions, which were adopted by the Governing Council, if we assume on the Governing Council that the market conditions are such that the monetary policy transmission process was affected, then this would be activated, under certain conditions, that is. And let me add, it's an important complement for a limit situation. So far, we haven't been to this limit, and I would hope I would wish that we don't need to activate the TPI program. Christian Siegenbiegel of the FSZ paper. Just two short follow-up questions. First, on risk provisioning, have you compared the risk provisioning of Bundesbank, what you have set aside compared to risk-weighted assets? Is this more than what other banks did? So are you in a relatively comfortable situation compared to an, any other Euro Central Bank and compared to the ECB. And the second question, you mentioned that you were going to solve the problem of losses by losses carried forward. Could you also have an inverse distribution to the German Ministry of Finance so that you get money from the German government? Well, first part of your question. I would never call this a comfortable situation. First of all, it's like this, and you have to be aware of the situation in 2022. Of course, 
This was a year with very extraordinary events. And typically, you cannot really match this with very responsible risk provisioning. But what we did was we started building up risk provisions in 2016. And my predecessor in this office pointed this out again and again, that monetary policy, if it's done in a very expansive way, then when there is a turnaround on interest rates, there will be risks for the balance sheet. And all I know, we can be quite, we are quite presentable with the provisions which we set aside, and we started very early on. It's up to 22, 20.2 billion that we built up, and 1 billion is now being used up for 2022. And the second part of your question, I can only tell, the procedure is quite clear. If there should be a situation in which there is a loss, then this will be covered by losses carried forward and will then be offset. So this is how we are going to treat it on the balance sheet. Nothing else. If I could make one quick comment on risk provisioning, because risk controlling is part of my responsibilities actually even before the 1st of January. How we measure and assess our risk is based on highly professional methodologies, methodologies as applied by commercial banks where a certain risk is identified. We have set aside provisions as best we could. And let's go back to this slide on page 11, where you can see the trend in our provisioning levels. When you look at the trend, these actuarial projections meant that until 2018, provisions were built up, had been built up, then reduced a little because the asset holdings had gone down a little. And then because of the PEP program and the high level of asset purchases, provisioning went up significantly. And uh, we weren't fast enough, so to speak, building up provisions accordingly, did everything we could, always transferring our annual net profit to the provision for general risks. And that has led to amount, the amount. So building our provisioning level has always been characterized by conservative thinking. However, such a massive rate hike in such a short period of time is something we hadn't expected. Javier Dessy from EconoStream is, will ask the next question. Thank you. I have a question to Mr. Nagel on the monetary policy timeline. This is where some of your colleagues have spoken up quite clearly over the last few days. And I wanted to ask you again, when do you see the peak of rate hikes? When, by which time would you like to see the peak of rate hikes, hikes achieved? When can we expect rate hikes to level out? As far as my expectation is concerned with respect to the necessary monetary policy steps, that is always based on the data that I look at before every monetary policy meeting of the ECB's Governing Council, which will be in two weeks' time. And uh, everything else would be speculation. I tried to make the point from my vantage point that I'm convinced that we have some way to go and that inflation will remain quite high for some time. But determining a point in time when uh, the plateau, the peak, will be reached, that would be highly speculative, and I couldn't do that. Frank Wiebel from Handelsblatt. Thank you. When reducing the balance sheet, your total balance, uh, we are really wondering to what level? How far would you go? as far as reducing liquidity to make sure that monetary policy is um, carried out from the lending side again? Or would you leave the total assets so high so that you can do it again through the deposit side? Um, that would be just interesting to see and to know. Has the Bundesbank any opinion 
do you tend towards one direction over the other? First of all, I gave you the number. When we look at the asset purchases, 5,000 uh, billion or 5 trillion is what we are talking about. The consolidated balance sheet of the euro system as a whole is still very high. So we have some time left to think about how uh, the new monetary policy framework would look like. What I can tell you is that at the Bundesbank, but also, also the, Euro, the Bundesbank, we are discussing this in detail. But any detail I would give you now would be far too early. Philippe Lacour again from AFP. Thank you. I would like to ask you a question concerning wage increases. In the statement you made, it says that these above average price increases should probably be reflected in prices. So can we understand this to mean that you're already pricing this in, that there will be above average increases and that inflation will remain high, especially here in Germany? The ECB, here it was said that uh, unions might tend to ask for overly high wage increases and that this could then start uh, an inflationary spiral which the ECB would like to avoid. So what do you mean by above average wage increases? And do you see anything which is given or would you also appeal to the union against the background which we know there are many conflicts here in Germany? So would you like to ask the unions to be moderate about this? Well, let me begin by this. If you look at wages in real terms, it's the third year now in which uh, employees, wage earners, had to take losses in real terms. It was 3.1 percent last year. So looking at it from a neutral point of view, it's quite understandable that the unions and the employers are engaging in these intense discussions on any wage increases. And in the monthly reports of Bundesbank, we commented on this, how we assess the present situation. And we made it quite clear that we do not see any wage price feedback loop. But we do see a certain possibility that there could be secondary impact. Even if uh, the wage increases are below the current inflation rate, they may still be high compared to the growth in production potentials and the medium-term inflation target of 2%. So in this respect, this is a constellation which doesn't include secondary effects. But I cannot, com I cannot uh, confirm that there is a wage price feedback loop. Carsten Englert. Hello, I have quite a few questions. First of all, on wage development, by rule of thumb, you also have uh, 16 to 17 percent of personnel spending. Is this a high wage increase, or has your headcount grown so much? Secondly, in fiscal policy, you write in your annual report that there has been a 200 basis point increases in the special fund of the EBRD. Has this been included? And then on payments, the start has been delayed several times. Uh, will this remain so? Well, on your last question, I can tell you it will remain so. In March, this project will now be concluded successfully. And I think it wasn't so uncommon that in a big project like this, in a big IT project like this, with this complexity, that there are certain delays. I wouldn't think this is so unusual, but in March now, it's going to start. What we see, especially when you look at the numbers, you mentioned the personnel costs, this trend towards higher costs, here especially the provision for support for the cost of sickness have been increased for Bundesbank. And your first question, could you help me on this? 
the personal expenses. Well, you know, Bundesbank, as a public sector employer, our salary structure follows the public sector agreements. So what you see here as a result is what is being negotiated at the moment and which will be reflected in our costs then. Moment. Are there any other questions? I don't see any. If we have answered all the questions that you have right now, let me then thank everybody. Thank you all for coming, for joining us. And uh, two more things. In conclusion, for those of you that have agreed a second round after this press conference, if you want a second round, that is, this will be available as a video from our website. And for those of you who have some time, are maybe a little hungry or peckish at least, let us warmly invite you to some refreshments, some light food and drinks outside uh, this room. Have a very nice day and hope to see you again.